When you're defining your columns in SQL Server Management Studio, you will find that the data type for each column presents you with a rather large set of choices of things that you could possibly use here. And it can be a little intimidating if you're new to SQL Server or you're not quite sure exactly which one you should be picking. So let's explore what some of those options are, at least what the most common ones that you'll want to know about. The data types are split really into categories. Is it character or text data? Is it a number? Is it a date? What actually is this? And then we can get a little bit more specific about each of those pieces. Let's start off with character or text data. Well, even when you're looking at this, you might be a little annoyed by the fact that you have six character data types, text, n-text, char, n-char, varchar, and n-varchar. And you might think, what, I'm supposed to make six decisions for every single bit of text that I have? Well, actually, it's a little simpler than that, because straight off the bat, we can lose two of these. Even though text and n-text will show up in that drop-down data type box, you should not use them. These are old school, and they're officially deprecated in this version of SQL Server, meaning they'll actually be removed from a future version. They're only there for backwards compatibility. So we're left with four, and we can choose between these four simply by asking two questions. One, is the data we're going to store Unicode or non-Unicode? And two, is it a fixed length or a variable length? If we need Unicode data, that's if you support or ever expect that you might possibly support international language character sets, you need to pick Unicode. And those are the two character data types with the letter N at the front of them, nchar and nvarchar. If you know that your text is only ever going to be plain old Western European character set, pick non-Unicode, which is char and varchar, without the N at the front. The impact is that if you pick Unicode, because Unicode can hold a much bigger character set in many, many different international languages, that takes up two bytes per character in SQL Server. If it's not Unicode, it's a char or varchar, it's one byte per character. Now, officially, SQL Server 2008 R2 has something called Unicode compression. So if you're really worried about the space, you can look into that. Now, I'm just a fan of using Unicode by default all the time. So I'll pretty much always pick the one with the N in front. But the next question that I have to ask is, is this fixed length or is it variable length? And that simply allows you to choose. If it's fixed length, it's nchar or char. If it's variable length, it's the one with the var inside it. And of course, that's going to be up to you. What is it that you're storing? If it's a product ID, for example, you might know that it's always going to be 10 characters long. If it's the contents of a blog entry, well, that's going to be a bit more variable. So you just answer these two questions, Unicode or non-Unicode, fixed length or variable length, and that will take you to the character data type that you need to pick. Now, once you've chosen that, you need to ask a couple of other questions. See, if it's a fixed length character data like nchar or char, well, you need to then predict the amount of space that's going to take. If it's nchar brackets 10, meaning it's a length of 10, that will take up to 20 bytes. And even if you only fill three characters of it, it will pad it with spaces. If it's just char of 10, it will be 10 bytes. SQL Server likes to know the size of it so it can make its own optimization about how much space this is going to take up in the system. But even if you're picking variable length character data, you need to know the impact this is going to have. If you specify an n varchar with a length of 10 characters, well, the length of it is flexible. It depends. The maximum this will be will be 20 bytes. But if you're only storing one or two characters, it should only take up the space for one or two characters. One of the questions might be, how long can this get? Well, if you're working with Unicode, the maximum length you can have of either an nchar and n varchar is 4,000. And that's 4,000 characters. Again, because it'll take by default two bytes per character, that's up to 8,000 bytes here. And because 8,000 is allowed, if you're just working with the non-Unicode version, your maximum is 8,000. 8,000 for a varchar or a char is the maximum specified length. Well, you might ask, what happens if it's bigger than that? Well, if it ever could be more than 8,000 bytes, either 4,000 Unicode characters or 8,000 regular ASCII characters, then you have one other choice. You just use the word max. 
or Varchar Max. That allows you up to two gigabytes per row per column. So you can store some pretty large stuff in here. You just can't specify a length any larger than 4,000 for Unicode and 8,000 for non-Unicode. Once you get beyond that, it's max. Next up, we have numeric data types. Let's start with the exact numbers. We have the classic int or integer storing whole numbers from roughly negative 2 billion to plus 2 billion. Nothing after the decimal point. They're always whole numbers. If you don't need that much space, you can have what's called a small int, which is roughly negative 32,000 to positive 32,000. You've got a tiny int, which is 0 to 255, if you know that you have a very small range. What if you want more than 2 billion? Well, you do have big int as well, which would be plus or minus 2 to the power 63. So that should hold pretty much whatever you can come up with. We also have money and small money. These are exact numbers. Even though they've got numbers after the decimal point, it's a fixed length. Both the money and the small money data types have four digits after the decimal point. Money can hold up to, well, as you can see here, that's a fairly large amount, whereas small money is plus or minus 214,748, and then four digits after the decimal point. Formally, with your exact numbers, you also have decimal, which is a fixed precision and scale. I'll explain what that means in a second. Now, you'll also see something called numeric. Decimal and numeric are exactly the same. Again, the two terms are here for kind of backwards compatibility. I pick decimal all the time. It doesn't really matter. Just pick one and stick with it. What precision and scale means is you define two numbers. The P represents the precision, the total amount of digits being stored in this column. And comma S for the scale is the amount of digits after the decimal point. So for example, creating decimal with 9 comma 2 means that there's 9 digits in total and 2 after the decimal point. So the maximum value would be 7 nines before the point and 2 nines afterwards. So that's decimal and numeric. You do have approximate or floating point numbers. You've got float where you say exactly what this the floating point should be. And then you have something called real. I would suggest that if you're getting into the floating point numbers and you need to be aware of those, we'll look them up on books online for more specific information. I'll show that in just a second. You do have several date and time data types. We have one that just holds a date. We have one that just holds a time. There is one that's called date time that's been around for quite a while, holds not only the date, but the time as well. Although SQL Server has something called date time two, and that is the one that's recommended, even though it looks kind of like an ugly data type. That's the one you should use if you need to store both dates and times because it's a bit more accurate, down to about 100 nanoseconds, and it doesn't take as much space as date time does. If you're working, however, with international time zones and you need to store your time offsetted from universal time code, there is also the date time offset, which takes that into account. So you could look at that one. And if you need on the other side a bit less precision, you can also look at small date time. But I'd say the main ones here should be reasonably obvious, which is you just need a date, use date. You just need a time, use time. You need both, use date time too. As you start to work with your data types, you will realize that they're not trying to give you several possible options for the same need. They really all do have pretty specific needs to them. There are several other data types. We have binary and var binary. As you might guess from looking at the char and var char, this really means a fixed length and a variable length binary field for storing things like file attachments. That can grow as big as two gigabytes, which you'll find is the fairly magic number for large column sizes in SQL Server. There's bit, which is basically a field that can be true or false. You've got XML. You can store raw XML data, even though it is text. And you could think, surely I could just put it in a text field. You could, but the XML column has the ability for SQL Server to understand the XML and even parse the XML if needed. There's a unique identifier, which would create a 16-digit unique ID, what's often referred to as a GUID, a globally unique identifier. And you can even define your own data types, though we're not going to do these in this course. There's a couple of other rarer ones that round it up. If you start looking through the drop-down box, you'll see things like geometry and geography for 
ellipses and paths and even for latitude and longitude. And there's a few other kind of deprecated ones like timestamp and image not to be used. Here's the real deal. Until this all becomes second nature, what you want to be doing is making sure that you're using SQL Server books online and use that as your little quick reference for these. Let me show you the easiest way to start working with that. If I open up my SQL Server books online, what I'm going to do is I want to find my data type definitions. Well, I can just type in the word in my index here. So I'm looking in my index, the second tab. And I'm saying data types. Now I select data types and I have all sorts of things. It says data types here and blanks and currency and all sorts of stuff. But unfortunately, I'm picking the wrong ones because SQL Server Books Online is showing me a bit too much information because I've got data types in Power Pivot for Excel and data types in CLR integration and data types ODBC. What I'm going to do is filter this down a little bit rather than have the unfiltered showing me every possibility. I'm going to say, give me the SQL Server 2008 database engine. And let me try that data types again. Well, we have a few still here, data types CLR, data types ODBC, data types OLEDB. Data types SQL Server is what I'm looking for. And if you're thinking, well, how do I know for sure? Well, unless you know that you're going for OLEDB or SMO or SQL Server application, this one's a pretty good bet. And if I highlight that, I can see that it starts talking about the related data types. I'll come down in this page. Let me delete that a little bit. We've got the data type categories. We've got the big ints and bits and decimals and ints. I could jump into any of these pieces, such as, say, small money, and it will tell me exactly what that range is for small money. So this looks like a pretty useful page to have for my data types as I'm getting used to them. And in fact, what I'm going to do is go up here onto my menu bar and just click Add to Help Favorites. Hit that button. And what that means is that from now on, if I want to just go and remind myself of the data types, I jump to my Help Favorite tabs in Books Online. I hit that and it will allow me to drop through all the different data types, the other ones, the binaries, the Unicode, character, date and time, all of it.